Good morning. Hayyim Yim Yud Ches Elul Chai Elul. So in the year that Hayyim Yim was published in 1943, so Chai Elul fell out on Shabbos Parshas Kisave. And on Shabbos Parshas Kisave, we obviously read Parshas Kisave. And we read Shishi, which includes the Teichecha, which is the 98 horrible curses which Hashem says will come on the Jewish people if they fail to keep the Torah. And in different Jewish communities, there are various customs about how you go about reading this Torah reading on Shabbos. And the Rebbe tells us that it is our custom that that we don't call up anybody for this Torah reading. That would be inappropriate. Instead, the Balkaira, the person who's reading the Torah, takes the reading for himself. And he's not even officially called up. He just goes up there and takes the reading for himself. Then the Rebbe tells us that today Chai Elul marks the anniversary of many, many important historical dates in the Hasidic history and in world history. And today Chai Elul is easily probably the most important day in the Hasidic calendar, in the Hasidic history, in, on the Hasidic calendar, and perhaps one of the most important days of all time. Like, it's a very important day. Because, so the first thing the Rebbe tells us is, Yaim Hayledes is a Baal Shem Tev Ches. Chai Elul marks the anniversary of the birthday of the Baal Shem Tev. The Baal Shem Tev was born on Chai Elul in the year 1698. And those Hebrew letters, Tof Ches, 1698, so if you rearrange them, they spell the word Nachas, which means pleasant, which means it's the year that pleasant things happened in, and pleasant, good energy came into the world. Additionally, in some Sepharim, it points out that if the, if the letters are rearranged, it also spells the word Chasim. Then, says the Rebbe, the second thing which happened on this day is Yoyim Shinis Galalav Mayri Vedabe HaKadosh Taf Pedalet. Exactly 26 years later to the day, on Chai Elul 1724, so on the Baal Shem Tev's 26th birthday, his teacher introduced himself to him, his teacher revealed himself to him. And his teacher was Achi HaShalaini, which is a biblical figure who was actually the teacher of Eliyahu Anavi, allied to the prophet. And he came to the Baal Shem Tev and he taught the Baal Shem Tev for a decade, for 10 years straight, he taught him everything he would need to know to do his incredible mission in this world, to transform the world with Chassidus. And the Chiyosh Lani taught the Baal for 10 years, and then 10 years later to the day, Yeim Shinis Gala HaBaal Shem Tev Tav Tzadik Dalet. On the Baal Shem 36th birthday, in the year 1734, so then a Chiyosh Lani told the Baal he's ready, now he has to reveal himself, and the Baal went, and he revealed himself, and he assumed the leadership, and he became a Rebbe. And he basically started the long life um, campaign, which we are on till today, to bring Mashiach, to spread Hasidus to the whole world, and to bring Mashiach, and hopefully that will end very, very soon with the coming of Mashiach. And then finally, says the Rebbe, is Yoim Heledes is Rabbeinu Hazak in Tafkofei. Today, Chayelul also marks the anniversary of the birthday of the Alter Rebbe, the first Chabad Rebbe, in the year 1745. On Chayelul 1745, the Alter Rebbe was born today. And it's actually because of this. If you rearrange the letters Tav Kof Hei, the year 1745, so it spells the word Kahas. And because of that, the Friedrich Rebbe in 1942, when he founded an institution to publish Hasidus Svarim, to publish Chabad Hasidus Svarim, to spread Hasidus to the whole world, that Hasidus should be available to the whole world, that people should be able to buy the books and read it and learn it and study it, and the idea should really um, make their way around. So he named that organization Kahas, because the Alter Rebbe, the founder of Chabad Hasidus, was born in the year Kahas. And basically what comes out is that Chayel is responsible for the entire Hasidic movement and the entire Hasidic revolution because the founder of Hasidus, the Baal Shem Tev himself, was born today Chayel. And the founder of Chabad Hasidus, the Alter Rebbe, was born today Chayel. And additionally, all the major events in the Baal Shem Tev's life which led to him going on his path to spread Hasidus to the whole world all happened on Chayel. So Chayel is a very, very important day, probably the most important day, again, on the Hasidic calendar. Then in the rest of the Hayim Yim, the Rebbe goes on to tell us something mind-blowing, and that is that on Chai Elul in the year 1892, the Baal Shem Tev taught a bunch of teachings. And this is amazing because the Baal Shem Tev passed away in the year 1760. And that means that 132 years after his death, after his passing in 1892, he taught these teachings, and that means on his 194th birthday he taught these teachings. And the backstory to this, and the backstory to these teachings, is that the Rebbe Roshab, the fifth Chabad Rebbe, so in Elul of 1892, he was trying to prepare a mimer. He was trying to prepare a mimer based on the mimer of his father, Rebbe Marash. And for some reason, it wasn't sitting right. And he worked really, really hard, and he really toiled and worked on it, and prayed very intensely, and went to his father's Eihel a lot. And finally, 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 he 
he worked out this mimer and he said it and it was beautiful. And that year, Chai Elo fell out on Shabbos, Parshas Kisave. And the Reverend Marash wanted to, so to speak, reward his son and um, uh, give him a treat for, and reward him for working so hard in Chassidus and for putting his mind so hard to, for Chassidus and, 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 yeah, working so hard for Chassidus and for the Chassidic cause and really caring about Chassidus that the Reverend Marash, who himself had already passed away, says, came to the Reverend Rashab. The Reverend Rashab said, my father came to me and he said that on Shabbos Parshas Kisave, I'm going to go up to the chamber of the Baal Shantiv, the Hechel of the Baal Shantiv, to the Hechel of the Baal Shantiv in Shemayim, and I want you to come with me as a reward for working so hard in producing Chassidus and in studying Chassidus. And it doesn't say how or in what form the Rebbe Roshab went with him, but the Rebbe Roshab went up with him to the Hechel of the Baal Shantiv. And they went up for the Baal Shantiv's birthday, and they were expecting the Baal Shantiv on his birthday to share some incredible um, Torah thoughts. And it's interesting, the Rebbe shared the story many, many times, and in one place, so he said they didn't go to Hechel of the Baal Shemte, they went to the Hechel of Mashiach, which it means they went to Mashiach's chamber, which is interesting. But in all the other sources, it says they went up to the Hechel of the Baal Shemte. And in any event, the Rebbe Roshab went up in some form with his father, Rebbe Marash, to the Hechel of the Baal Shemte on Shabbos, Parshish Kisave, 1892. And over there it says that they saw that the Baal Shemte had gathered together a massive hakel of Yidin. He had gathered a huge crowd of Neshamas. And it says that all his chassidim were there, and all his students were there, and all his student students were there, and even the women, the nashim, were there. That's what it says. And the Rebbe says, from this we see three incredible things. The first thing is that, from the fact that it says all the chassidim and their students and their student students were there, it means everybody associated with the Hasidic movement was there. Which means that all of us, every single last one of us, all of our neshamis were there, all of us, our neshamis were there on that day, and we heard the Baal Shantiv say these teachings, say the teachings we're about to share. It was a little bit like how all neshamis stood up at Har Sinai, so all Hasidic neshamis, all, Has all neshamis associated with Hasidus stood by the Baal Shem Tev in Chai Elul, 1892. And the second thing the Rebbe said is that what's funny is that the Baal Shem Tev taught and spoke to his students and his student students, which seemingly is a waste of time because he should talk directly to his students and let his students dumb it down to their students. Why did he have to go and also teach directly his students' students. Let, let him teach his students, let his students teach their students' students, and let his students' students teach their wives and their daughters. So he says, no. From the fact, from the fact that Baal Shem Tev went and, and, and tried to reach directly for three circles of influence, what we see is that in, in our mission to spread Hasidus in the world, in our mission to teach Hasidus in the world, we can't, it's not enough that we just reach out to and teach and influence our direct circle of influence. That's nice and that's good and that's a good start, but we can re spread Chassidus so much faster and in such a more powerful way if we reach a lot further than that, if we try to reach at least three circles of influence. And if every one of us tried to reach beyond our own direct circle of influence and reach at least three circles of influence, and as far as we can possibly reach, then we could spread Chassidus a lot faster and a lot more intense way, and that's what the Baal Shantip was trying to do himself and show us that that's what we should be doing. And the third thing the Rebbe said, which is very interesting, he said that a lot of people nowadays take issue with the fact that we encourage women to study Torah and specifically to study Hasidus and to know a lot of Hasidus and learn a lot of Hasidus and teach a lot of Hasidus. And they say this is very, very anti-traditional Judaism and this is not, this is the new Mishagas. And the Rebbe says from this story we see that this is, this is totally not true. We see from the Baal Shem Tev himself that the Baal Shem Tev himself made a point of making sure that the, the female Neshames were all there. He wanted all the women's Neshames to be in attendance when he taught Hasidus, when he spread Hasidus, that they should hear, they should learn, they should get it as well. And we see that women have a very important part to play in the study of Chassidus and in the spreading of Chassidus. Yeah, okay, so that's what he said. Then, said the, Baal Shem, said, so the Rebbe Shab said that over the course of the Shabbos, the Baal Shem Tev taught seven teachings. And the last five teachings were said to only exclusive neshamas, exclusive souls, very powerful souls. And I believe that it's not recorded publicly what the Baal Shem Tev said. But the first two teachings, which is the content of the rest of today's Yimim, so the Baal Shem Tev said to this massive group of, of Hasidim, to this massive hakel. And <clears throat> all the teachings were on the opening words and the opening psukim of Parshas Ki Sabe. And it says that first, right when Shabbos came in, they daven, they, they daven Kabbalah Shabbos. And the, the Friday night um, prayer, the Friday night davening, so it's divided into two halves. The first half is known as Kabbalah Shabbos, where it's a service where we welcome the Shabbos, and we welcome the Shabbos queen. And then the second half is the standard Meyer. Now, we usually just daven it back-to-back, -back and we go through the whole thing, so most people don't realize the difference. 
but it's really two different parts. And in the olden days, a lot of Jews would go out into the fields for Kabbalah Shabbos to, to, to welcome Shabbos. And it says that in heaven, they did Kabbalah Shabbos, and then they stopped. And after Kabbalah Shabbos, the Baal Shem Tev said his first teaching. And the Baal Shem Tev said that the opening words of the Parsha is, this is what the Baal Shem Tev said after Kabbalah Shabbos on Chai El Shabbos, Shabbos Chai El, Parsha Kisavei 1892. He said the opening the opening words of the of the Parsha Kisavei are, "V'haya Kisavei Ela Eretz V'Gamer," which literally it's it's addressing the Jewish people. And the pasuk, what it literally means is, it says, "When you, the Jewish people, are going to come into the land, when you are going to get the land of Israel, so Hashem will give you the land of Israel as a gift." And you should know that the land of Israel is rightfully yours. It's your rightful inheritance. The, the land belongs to the Jewish people. You're just coming to claim it and get it, but it's rightfully yours. And the Baal Shem Tev said that Eretz Lashem Merutzo Lashem Notzin Kedisa Medrash. That it says in the it says in the Medrash that the Hebrew word Eretz, so the Hebrew word Eretz, so besides for meaning land, which means the land of Israel, the word is also related to the, to two other Hebrew words, to the Hebrew word Merutza, which means to run or to be like pull to or to be running towards, or to be drawn to, or ratzin, which is to have a very strong desire for something, to be desirous for something, to want something very badly. And therefore, therefore, what based on that, how it teaches, is Eretz Yisrael means when a Jew suddenly is hit with a certain amount of inspiration, and they're suddenly into Hashem, and they're in the mood for Hashem, and they desire Hashem, and they have a very strong, passionate desire to connect with Hashem, and to connect with Hashem deeply. And they're very into Hashem. And therefore, how you're meant to read the Pasuk said the Baal Shem Tev, how you're meant to read the whole Pasuk is, as do best two commands minatzin, but is a matanam al maylam b'yudosh b'cholechem Yisrael. So he says, what the Pasuk reads is, v'hayi kisav el aret, if suddenly you find yourself coming into a land, if suddenly you come into a sudden burst of inspiration, you're just sitting around doing your thing, and one morning you wake up, and you're suddenly super into Hashem, and you want to connect with Hashem, and you're, you're, you're desiring Hashem very badly, and you're trying to connect with Hashem very strongly, you suddenly have come into a massive... Um, piece of land, you've come into a massive piece of inspiration. So he said, what you could think, and what, and what humans usually think, is when we're inspired, we feel like we're always going to be inspired. When we're on a high, we feel like we're going to be on a high forever. And this, of course, is not the case. And the inspiration could last for a day or a week or a month, but then it just disappears one day, and we're back to square one, and often we're worse than where we started because now we have to suffer with the fact that we've lost this amazing high in inspiration. And it's a little bit like uh, someone who wins the lottery, so they just have fun, so it's great for, for whatever, a year, but then when they lose all the money, they're in a really bad place. So that's, 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 um, that's, that's, what, that's, how, that's how inspiration works. And as opposed to if somebody would invest that money, so even though it's a little less fun, and they might not be able to live as extravagantly, but if they invest that money wisely, then they'll be able to live at least comfort, comfortably and with dignity for the rest of their life. So in the same way, it says in Chassidus, that whenever you get inspired, that's an investment. Hashem's giving you some money, and you can either just blow it and have fun, or you can you can invest it wisely, and you can you can tie it down and anchor it down, and really capture it and channel it in a way that will last. And he says that's the continuation of the pasuk. The continuation of the pasuk is, "Adi avida darzayim yeshavta, arab tragen in his yashvas, for the kachta gamer v'samta b'tana mamshech zayin eres b'kedem." So the pasuk continues. Literally, it says, "When you enter this land that Hashem gives you, so you should settle there. You should settle in the land. You should really dig in." And you should build yourself a house. You should plant um, crops. And when your crops grow, so as a thank you to Hashem, you should take the first fruits, known as Bikurim, and you should put them in baskets and prepare to take these baskets as a gift to Hashem. That's the literal meaning. But the Baal Shem Tev said the deeper meaning is what it means to settle in the land is when you get this inspiration, don't just let it be fluffy, amazing, floaty inspiration, which will disappear like that. You have to tie it down somehow. You have to anchor it down somehow. You have to find a way to channel it and capture it and really internalize it. And that way it will last and stick around. And you have to, the way to internalize it is to capture it and anchor it in tangible acts. And intangible actually changes in your life and in your routine. And when you stick with those, that's how you, that's how you, that's the inspiration can actually uplift your life for years to come. And, and yeah, and, and radically, yeah, you don't, don't just walk around and feel good and feel great. You feel inspired. That's beautiful, but it won't do anything. If you, if you if you channel it and, and tie it down and anchor it down in tangible actions and changes, that's how you maintain the inspiration. When you take that inspiration, that light, and you put it into Kalim, into tangible um, channels through which uh, channel ch practical things and anchors to hold it down, that's how you keep the R. That's what the R is meant for. Okay. 
Then the Pasa continues. So literally, again, the Pasuk means you should take the baskets and you should bring them, the, the place you should bring the sacrifice, the sacrifice of the fruits, you should bring them to the special place which Hashem has chosen. The special place which Hashem has chosen in the world, which in general Israel is the chosen land, but in Israel the chosen city is Jerusalem, is Yerushalayim, and in Yerushalayim the chosen location is the temple, is the Beis Hamidash. That is the holiest place on earth, that is the place that Hashem has chosen to make a home for himself. And it says you're meant to take the baskets of fruit to the place that Hashem has chosen, to the base of Megdash. But the Baal Shem it very interesting. He said, not literally, the way you're meant to read it is, a yid dar visen, as er geit fun ein art in der anderen, is er nit, is, it, is, is nit er geit alein nar mefirtim al maila? So he says, nit er geit alein nar mefirtim al maila. He says, people think when we go places, whenever we end up somewhere, so we always think, it's natural for humans to think, that it's our choices and it's our mistakes or choices that brought us to this place. And wherever we go in the world, physically, emotionally, or mentally, wherever we end up, we always think, we always think back, we say, because I chose to end up here, because I, th I took certain steps, I ended up here. And we either give ourselves credit for ending up in a certain place or we blame ourselves for ending up in a certain place. And we say, the reason why I'm here in this terrible place is because I made the bad decision, I chose to come here, I, took, I made certain mistakes in life, or I, took, I made certain decisions in life. If we find ourselves in a certain emotional place, we say again, I made certain mistakes, I made certain choices, and that's why I'm here. This is terrible. Uh, we end up in a certain mental state, same thing. And the Bashanta said something amazing. What the, what the Torah is telling you is, You have to know that you have no, we have no control over our lives. We have no control. We can't change our destiny or anything. Hashem controls everything. And therefore, Wherever you end up, wherever you go, whichever place you go to, you should know that it was Hashem who put you there. It was Hashem who sent you there. You, it was a, you can't be somewhere if Hashem didn't sanction it, if Hashem didn't put you here, if Hashem didn't send you here, if Hashem didn't want you here. If you are here right now, it's because Hashem put you here. If Hashem wanted you somewhere, you have no power, and Hashem always wants us, always has a plan, He always wants us somewhere at a specific place, you have no power, you have to be egotistical to think that you have the power to override Hashem and put yourself somewhere else where Hashem doesn't want you to be. If you're here somewhere, it's because Hashem has put you here. Hashem wants you here. Hashem needs you here for a certain reason. And he said, what is the reason? And there's only one reason ever why we're ever anywhere. It's the same reason why we're anywhere. There's only one reason why Hashem, there's only one point, Hashem, there's only one thing Hashem cares about, and that's what everything is for, and that's why anywhere anyone ever is, is always for this one point. When the Kavana is, L'shakin Shemayisham. So again, the literal meaning is, you should take the baskets of fruits, bring it to the chosen location in the world, which is Jerusalem, and by the way, Medish, and Hashem chose Jerusalem to um, rest his name there. That that place should represent him, that he should have a presence there, that, um, yeah, that everyone, that other, that in the basement you see clearly Hashem's presence, and Hashem is a presence there. Hashem is represented there. And that's where you should bring the baskets of fruits. But the, but the Baal Shem Tov Taish did it differently. He said, so wherever you end up in life, wherever you go, physically, emotionally, mentally, Hashem put you there. Hashem wanted you there for a specific reason. For what reason? The Shachin Shem to make up to bring him a presence there. Hashem wanted to be represented there. Hashem wanted to be found there and discovered there and revealed there. If Mefar Sinzain and Kos in them are Dvuar is. Whichever location you find yourself is, you have to reveal Hashem in this place. You have to reveal Hashem's truth and Hashem's light in this place by connecting with Hashem in that place and yeah, and remembering Hashem in that place. And the only reason, again, why you end up anywhere in any dark or challenging place, in any physical dark or challenging place, in any emotional dark or challenging place, in any mental dark or challenging place, so it may seem like it was your choices and mistakes which brought you there, but that is not true. Hashem brought you here to make a dear bit to reveal him in that place, to find him in that place, to reveal his truth in that place. And that is what the Baal Shantiv said. And after the Baal Shantiv said that, they daven myrav. And Akhar Tfilas Mayra, Akhar Tfilas Arvis, Chazar Oida Pam Tayra Kedamas Vahisif. After Mayrev, so the Bashemte then repeated this a second time. He went over it. And after he went over it a second time, now he added a second Tayra. And the second Tayra was again on the opening words of Parshish Kisabe. But now he translated them a little bit differently. And he said, Vahaya Kisabe, Bechte Duzal Sukem and Tumnatsin Hulu. So originally he touched the opening words, Baha'i Yikisave, when you'll come into a sudden burst of inspiration, when you find yourself suddenly inspired, the Pasuk tells you what you need to do with that inspiration. Don't waste it, don't squander it, use it wisely, invest it wisely. But now the Bashan to translate it differently, he said, Baha'i Yikisave Laris means if you want to get inspired, if you want to feel connected, you're sitting around, 
You're like, why am I not being inspired? Why am I not feeling connected? This is terrible. I want to be inspired. I want to feel connected. You want to come into a land. You want to inherit a big piece of land. You want to suddenly feel inspired. So the, so the Pasuk's telling you, if you want to feel inspired, if you want to feel connected, don't sit around on your, on your tachas. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to do to take your inspiration in your own hand. This is what you need to do. This is what you can do to get yourself inspired. Instead of just focusing on yourself and thinking about yourself and how you can feel good and how you can feel the most inspired and how you can feel the most connected, which basically your whole Judaism becomes an ego trip, ironically, the way that we become most inspired and the way we most become most connected is when we stop thinking about ourselves and what will make us feel good and feel most inspired and feel most connected. Instead, when we think about... When we, when we make it our life's mission to go to, for, to, to go to foreign places, to go to far off places, to go to dark places, to go to challenging places in order to reveal Hashem in those places and to introduce Hashem into those places and to reveal Hashem in those places. And it's If you are Meisha Nefesh, if you go out of your comfort zone and are not focusing on what makes me feel comfortable and what's easy for me and what makes me feel good, instead you go out of your comfort zone and you do what's not easy and what doesn't make you feel good, for the greater cause, for the mission, to help the world around you, to help the people around you, to help societies around you, to help Hashem, that you, that you are looking, where can you help? Where can you, wh who need, who's, who's in such a dark place that they can use some inspiration? Who's in such a dark place that they can learn the truth? They could use the truth. And you go wherever you can and try to introduce Hashem wherever you can and to where it's most needed. And you go into the darkest, darkest places so by that kind of selflessness, by that kind of serious nefesh, ironically, by not focusing on what will make you feel best, that's actually how you end up becoming most inspired and feeling most connected and actually really connecting with Hashem. And by being, the more you're Meister Nefesh, the more you go out of your comfort zone and do what doesn't make you feel good and what's not easy for you. And he said, Now, okay, so you're ready. You want to go to a very challenging place, um, a very physical, a very challenging physical place, a certain community or location, which is very challenging and daunting and dark. But you're there, how do you actually, what, what do you do there to connect with Hashem, to reveal Hashem, to introduce Hashem to this location? So he says, the way you're Mephaisa Malikos, the way you introduce Hashem to places, the way you reveal Hashem in places, the way you spread Hashem in Malikos places, is mit bracha mit apasak tehillim. It's very simple, nothing crazy. By making a bracha, by making a blessing, and by saying a pasuk, a verse, into Tehillim. When you make a bracha, when you remember Hashem in this place, because the purpose of brachas is, is to constantly be mindful of Hashem and, and remember Hashem and never forget Him. So when you remember Hashem wherever you are, and you, you make a, a blessing to Hashem, a small prayer to Hashem, that is how you introduce Hashem to somewhere. That's how you, you, you connect with Hashem wherever, and that's where you um, reveal Hashem in everything, wherever you are. And the bottom line is, wherever you end up, whatever place, whatever dark or challenging place, so remember Hashem sent you there, and it's for you to, the purpose is for you to discover Hashem in that place. And if you're looking for inspiration, you should actively seek places that need, need some light and need some Hashem in their life and go there and try to introduce them and try to find Hashem from that location. And that is the, that is the second teaching. Those are the two teachings which the Baal Shem Tev taught. And the Rebbe spoke about the Sayyim Yem a lot, a lot, a lot, many, many times, perhaps more than any other Yem Yem. And they even made a kuntras, a pamphlet, out of all the Rebbe's talks on the Sayyim Yim, putting it together, all the Rebbe's explanations on the Sayyim Yim, and on these two teachings of the Baal Div, and just a few interesting points which the Rebbe said. So one point is about what we mentioned earlier, that the Baal Div didn't just address the male Nishames, it said the Baal Div made a, uh, made a point of gathering together and addressing these teachings both to the male Nishames and to the female Nishames, even to the Nashim. And the Rebbe says, so besides for meaning, obviously, the male neshamas and the female nashim, the female neshamas in the simple sense, additionally, he says, certain neshamas, even certain male neshamas, are more masculine, or they're more, they're naturally mashpiyam, and certain neshamas are softer and gentler, and are more, are more, uh, are more, uh, yeah, they're naturally, they're mashpiyam, they're makablam. While some are mashpiyam, some are naturally um, makablam. And while some, while some neshamas, some male neshamas, some female neshamas are, are naturally more mashpi and they're more assertive and aggressive and loud in their, um, in their, in the way they try to influence people and influence environments, some neshamas again are more softer and gentler. Now, 
people would think, a lot of people could think, and a lot of men could think, that if they're naturally a mashpia, if they're naturally a leader type, and they're loud and assertive, and they don't, and that's their style, then the whole Hasidic revolution and spreading Hasidus is for them. They're meant to go out there and teach, and influence, and change the world. But if that's naturally not their style, they're not a mashpia by nature, then they're not a, they're not a teacher by nature. They're not that they're not a, a leadership a leader by nature. Then this is not for them. The the, the the Hasidic revolution is not for them. They're meant to support it in other ways, but that's not for them. And the Rebbe said this is not the case because the method the method of how Judaism went about conquering the world and fighting the world and transforming the physical world pre Hasidism and pre Baal Shem Tev, so that was actually more geared towards the the male approach which is then we were a little bit more at odds with the world and in conflict with the world. And, um, yeah, we fought the world a little bit more head-on. He says what the what Hasidus introduced and what the Baal Shem Tev introduced is a way of, of, of winning over the world in a much more, in a much gentler way, in a much peaceful way, uh, to, to integrate the world and to be, and yeah, to integrate the world in a much more peaceful, gentler way. And he says because of that, and just, you see, you see in the style of Baal Shem Tev and in all the Rebbe, and specifically in the Rebbe, which the Rebbe really embodied the energy of Malchus, that ever really embodied Mashiach energy and the feminine energy, that in the way he dealt with people, it was always very, um, it was always very delicately and with a lot of diplomacy and very gently and patiently. And very, very, it was very uncommon for the Rebbe to be aggressive or abrasive in any way. And even the way he, even the way, even a style of learning and the way he would explain ideas and, 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 and work out different sources. So he had this incredible style and approach, and Hasidus does it in general, where it kind of makes everything work together masterfully. And it says that things don't really need to conflict with each other. And it puts everything together so, so elegantly and beautifully and, and like gently and softly. And that's just like, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a certain underlying approach of Hasidus that makes everything work together and fit together in a way of, in a gentle, peaceful way, without needing to break anything, or being, or, or yeah, 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 okay, side note. So that, that's the, that's the approach of Chassidus, that's the approach of the Bashanta, that's the approach of the Rebbe, and that's, that's the approach of the Hasidic revolution, and so he said, because of that, because this is the style of Hasidus and this is the style of the the Bashanta encouraged and said that even female, female neshames, even, which means even men which are not naturally in the mashpia kind of role, even if they're naturally more of a mushpa, they are, expected of to participate in this revolution as well because the style of the revolution is for everyone and the the, the feminine approach has an equal approach has an equal um can participate equally if not more so than than with the male approach okay in any event so that's point that's one point the Rebbe made another point the Rebbe made two other points that are related is the Rebbe said that it says in Hasidus that at first the Nisham is in Shemayim it's in heaven before it's born and over there, life's amazing. It's great. Everything's it's connected. It's inspired. It's in a great place. Everything's amazing. It's it's in a healthy, holy, wholesome environment. And it says when the soul has to come down into this world, so while it knows that that's what it has to do, the soul is very, very scared and hesitant. Doesn't really want to come down into this world because this world is so daunting and dark and challenging. And for a long time, the soul's not going to feel. It's not in the immediate. It's not in the immediate best interest for the soul to come to this world. This world is a sucky, sucky place for the soul. It gets cut off from what it likes and what it wants, and it really has to go out of its comfort zone. It says the soul does not want to come into this world. It comes in kicking and screaming. It doesn't want to be born. Now the Rebbe said what people don't realize is that even once we are born in this world itself, there's so many levels and there's so many different um, experiences and environments. And he says you can live your whole life in a cocoon within the physical world. You're, you're technically in the physical world, but you basically escape to this like beautiful heaven within this world. You're in this like amazing, beautiful community, or you're in a certain beautiful, safe environment or community, which is beautiful. But he said, again, that's defeating the whole purpose because if you're going to run away, then you didn't have to come to this world. You could have been in heaven. In this world itself, you have to leave heaven and go into the physical world. And he said, any time that the soul is called, or any time the soul has an opportunity to go into a, to go in, into the world, more into the world, and to, to, to go into and to influence a darker place and a lower place, he says the same, the soul has the exact same hesitation. It doesn't want to resist it. It doesn't want to, it just wants to stay in its comfort zone and keep doing what will make it feel good and connected and inspired. It doesn't want to go places that will challenge it or that are dark or that are, yeah, that will, that will make it feel disconnected and won't make it feel good or connected. And the Rebbe says, again, person has to constantly, constantly be reminding themselves 
and pushing themselves, being mysterious and that pushing themselves out of their comfort zone to 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 remember, forget about themselves and get over themselves and remember what the cause is and what the mission is and what about Mashiach and about making a Tainim and what their duty is and to keep going further and further and further as much as possible to reach as far as we can. And the second point the Rebbe made, which is connected, is that he said, imagine that the Baal Shem Tev himself was in Shemayim talking to these Neshamis. And the Baal Shem Tev himself, these were Neshamis in Shemayim, and the Baal Shem Tev himself was talking to them, and he was describing to them and telling them about the importance of Dir and the importance of the mission, and why we have to go down and change the whole world, and, and introduce Hashem to every last place in this world, and every, place, place, every last physical place, every last experience and environment. And he says, even so, even though the Baal Shem Tev himself was for bringing with them and inspiring them, and it was probably amazing, even though the Baal Shem Tev said, I know that it's still going to require Mesir's Nefesh. Even after all this, you're not going to be in the mood, you're not going to be running to go do what I'm telling you to do, because it's so difficult, it's so daunting. And the, and the Baal Shem Tev said, I, I know it's still going to take Mesir's Nefesh, it's still, you're still going to have to push yourself, and push yourself harder than you've ever pushed yourself, and really, really go out of your comfort zone, and really make yourself uncomfortable, to do what I'm asking you to do. So the Rebbe said, if that was the case with the, with the Nishamis, which were eye to eye with the Baal Shem Tev, which were in the Baal Shem Tev's face, then for sure us, who never saw the Baal Shem Tev, and who never heard these words from the Baal Shem Tev himself, at best, we're reading these words in this book. So he said, of course, for us, we, for us, it's very tough. And for us, it requires a real, real mysterious nefesh to actually implement the, the call of the CMEM and to actually go about doing this. But the Rebbe said, What's unique about our generation and what our super weapon is, is Mysterious Nefesh. We don't have any other skill to boast about, but our, our generation is the generation of Mysterious Nefesh, a generation which is capable of saying, we don't care if something doesn't make us feel good or makes us go out of our comfort zone. We believe this is right. We believe this is true. We believe this is MS. This is our duty. This is what we're here to do. This is what Hashem wants, and this is what we're going to do, no matter what. And yeah. So, Mashiach now, have a wonderful day, and happy Chayel.